I'm going to get back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 at the end of this message. And I'm going to speak on this subject. What is the requirement for baptism and the Lord's table? Now, you and I can be right on baptism. It's form, it's mode. We can be right on how the Lord's table should be observed. And we want to observe these things according to the scripture. Baptism by immersion. The Lord's table we take at night because they did it at night. The same night the Lord was betrayed, he took bread. We take bread, unleavened bread and wine because that's what they used then. Uh, we take the bread and eat, pray, and then we take the wine and drink and pray because that's the order they did then. And I have no doubt that we ought to do things the way they did it. Now, that being said, you can be right on those things and split hell wide open. That's an important, important part of this message. What is the requirement? Notice I didn't say what are the requirements. What is the requirement for baptism and the Lord's Supper? Now, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper or the Lord's table. In the Roman Catholic Church, there are seven, and they don't call them ordinances, they call them sacraments. But there are only two in Scripture, baptism and the Lord's table. And notice I called them ordinances and not sacraments. And that is very important. To call them sacraments is to say that divine grace is imparted through them. That's what meant, is meant by a sacrament. They are not that they are not means of grace. They are not vehicles through which grace is conveyed. They never are. And to make them that is to make salvation by works. That's all it is. You get grace through being baptized. You get grace through observing the Lord's table. No, you don't. That would make salvation by works. These things do not convey grace. There's only one means of grace. You know what that is? Faith. By grace are you saved through faith. Now, it doesn't say by grace are you saved through faith and reading or hearing the gospel or reading the Bible or praying, as important as those things are. But there's one means through which grace comes, and that is faith. And that's the gift of God. By grace are you saved through faith. Now, somebody may ask the question, can you be saved without observing these ordinances? And the answer is yes. The thief on the cross was not baptized. The thief on the cross did not ever observe the Lord's table. And he was saved. The Lord said today, You'll be with me in paradise. I mean, he was given full assurance of his salvation, and he was never baptized, and he never took the Lord's table. But if you do not observe them, speaking of baptism and the Lord's table, if you do not observe them, you better have as good an excuse as he did. He couldn't. He was nailed to a tree. He died within a few hours. He would have if he could have. Now understand, 
Baptism, the Lord's table, they're not sacraments. They're not means of grace. There is no saving efficacy in those. But they're very important. Baptism is very important. And refusal to be baptized is quite simply disobedience to Christ. What else can you call it? If someone refuses the marriage ceremony and cohabits with the person that they're living with, but they refuse the marriage ceremony, but we love one another. We love one another. What's a ceremony? What's a piece of paper? We love one another. Where's the commitment? When you're married, you are committed for life. It's a very strong statement. I'm committed this per to this person for the rest of my life. And cohabiting without being married speaks of several things, but among them is no commitment to that person, no true commitment. And I look at somebody not baptized, being baptized, being pretty much the same way. I'm not committed. I'm not committed. I, I believe, but I'm not committed. Now, a ceremony. Somebody says, well, how important are ceremonies? Well, look at it from another direction. Um, let's say somebody takes the American flag and stamps on it and desecrates it and burns it and tears it up. You could say, it's a piece of material. What is the big deal? What is the problem with that. It's a free country. What does that flag represent? I know it's a symbol, but what does it represent? To stamp on that flag and show disrespect to that flag is to show great disrespect for this country and those people who died to make it to where we're free. Yes, it's a symbol, but it means something very important. But if I look at baptism as a sacrament or a means of grace, it's a debasing of the ordinance and it's a denial of what it means in the first place. Now, what does baptism signify? And this is very important because when the writer to the Hebrews gives the six um, oracles or ordinances or elements of the faith there in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, one of those six Elements of the faith is the doctrine of baptisms. Now, what is the doctrine of baptisms? The doctrine of baptisms is union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the doctrine is. It's union with Christ. When I'm baptized, I'm saying, here's everything in my salvation. Here's all my hope that when he lived, I was in him. And I lived too. And when he died, I was in him, and I died too. And when he was raised from the dead, justified, having pleased the Father, I was in him, and I did too. And this is all my salvation and all my desire. Union with Christ. Now, what is the one requirement for baptism? There's only one. Faith in Christ. Looking to Christ only. I love what our Lord said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Whoso believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I think it's interesting that, you know, the Lord quite often lets, says things in such a way to give people enough rope to hang themselves if that's what they want to do. Because you can take that verse of Scripture and say, see, you need to be baptized to be saved. It says, whoso believeth and is baptized, the same should be saved. 
And he went on to say, he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, if you want to take something like that, you can hang yourself with it. But why does the Lord state it that way? Whoso believeth and is baptized, the same shall be saved. What's the one requirement for baptism? Believing. <laughs> Believing. Whoso believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What must someone do to be baptized? Believe the gospel. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he's God's Christ? Do you believe the Father is pleased with him? Do you rely on him only as everything in your salvation? Then you are to be baptized. Now, one thing I know about infant baptism. That infant does not believe. It's as simple as that. That infant does not believe. Now, a lot of people practice infant baptism. I've heard people say, well, so-and-so did it, and so-and-so in the past, and they preached the gospel. You know, my thought is, I don't care about any of that. I really don't. You say, well, somebody 200 years ago did this. Who cares? What does God's Word teach? That's all I care about. What does God's Word teach? teach. Sure doesn't teach infant baptism because that infant cannot believe. And if I do not believe I should not be baptized, infant baptism makes a mockery of scriptural baptism. If you baptize an infant, I don't care what you say, you're saying somehow that makes it better for that infant. Somehow. You might not even be able to explain how. But somehow, if that infant is baptized, he's put in a more savable state. Somehow, grace in some way is conferred through that act. And really, when it comes right down to it, it's salvation by works. That's all it is. If you practice infant baptism, that is salvation by works. Baptism is the believer's confession of Christ. Now, let me show you a passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 1. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And that is remit, repentance, it doesn't mean you repent and then your sins are remitted. It's really repentance, a change of mind with regard to, unto the remission of sins. That's what repentance is more than anything else. Preachers all the time say, repent of your sins. Repent of your sins. I'm going to say, what do you mean by that? Well, I know what they mean by it. You need to stop committing them. And turn and look to Christ. We ought to stop committing them. I'm not calling that into question. But that's not what repentance means. It doesn't mean stop your sins and turn to Christ. That, that's putting something between the sinner and the Savior. That's not what that means at all. Repentance is a change of mind regarding the remission of sins. A complete change of mind. Look in verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, does that mean some individual gets up before his baptism and says, I confessed. I took drugs. I had sex outside of marriage. I, I named just a litany of sins that I, that I actually have committed. And um, once you get all those confessed, I stole something, I, I hated somebody, I murdered somebody, whatever it might be. I confessed my sins, and now I'm a candidate for baptism. That's foolishness. You know that, and I know that. We're not supposed to confess our sins, our individual sins, to one another. You confess them before God, not before men. What this is saying, we're making this confession when we're baptized. And I thought about, just because I thought about it, it doesn't make it so, but I thought a lot about this. When I'm baptized, I'm confessing I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, and the only way I can be saved is if I'm united to Christ so that what he did, I did. That's my only hope. You know, 
I hear people talking about good Christians. That's an oxymoron. If you're a Christian, by your own confession, you're a sinful person needing God's grace and needing God's mercy. So when they were baptized, this act of baptism is the believer's public confession. It's not coming down front and getting up the nerve to come down front and say, everybody, I believed, and, you know, in the result of the altar call and all that. No, no, that's not your public confession. Baptism is the believer's public confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you two places people struggle with regard to baptism. This is people who hear the gospel. There's two places they struggle. Number one, when I was baptized, first baptized, I didn't believe the gospel that I believe now. Now, let me take care of that for you. You weren't baptized. You might have got dunked under water, but you weren't baptized. You see, the only people who are baptized are people who believe the gospel. That's who's baptized. And so if you went through a religious ritual without believing the gospel, you never were baptized in the first place. Now here is the second thing that we have trouble with. I look back when I was baptized and I think, how much did I know? How much did I really know? How much did I really understand? Now, let me remind you, the qualification for baptism is not knowledge. It's not how much you know. It's who you believe. That's, the, that's all that counts. Did you look to Christ only as everything in your salvation? Sure, you, you know, I, I hope I know a lot more now than I did when I was first baptized, but that doesn't invalidate my baptism. It doesn't. I, it, it's not what, it's who. Do you look to Christ only? Do you believe what baptism signifies that your only hope of salvation is if you were in him, when he lived, you lived, when he died, you died, when he was raised from the dead, accepted by God, you were accepted. That is faith in Christ. You look to him only. Faith is the one requirement for Christian baptism. Now what about the Lord's table? We are observing the Lord's table tonight. We do this on the first Sunday of every month. And like I said, we do it at night because that's when they did it in the New Testament. The same night the Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And with regard to the Lord's table, you know, I'd like to see everybody here every Sunday night. I would. Um, Sunday is not called the Lord's morning, but the Lord's day. I realize there's some people who can't come every Sunday night. I realize that. I'm not trying to... Um, put anybody under bondage. But if there was a service that I wouldn't want to miss more than any other service, it would be when we observe the Lord's table because the Lord said, this do in remembrance of me. Now, what's more important than that? This do, as often as you do it, in remembrance of me. Now, there's tonight, by God's grace, there's some people getting together for this one purpose, the remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the remembrance of his death on Calvary's tree as everything in our salvation. And not show up for that. This do in remembrance of me. And I do not understand not showing up for this above any other service we have. Now, would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? What is the requirement to take the Lord's table? And I've got to ask that because I can remember a time when I did not want to take the Lord's table. And I was a believer. But I didn't want to take the Lord's table. And I wouldn't really want to show up when they were having it because of the scriptures found here in 1 Corinthians 11, particularly this one about whoso eateth unworthily. Huh. Um, 
He fails to discern the Lord's body. He eats and drinks to himself damnation. And all I thought of, and I thought of worthiness, is am I worthy to take the Lord's table? And so I missed the complete meaning of it and really didn't want to take it because I was afraid of what would take place with me because I didn't really deserve to take the Lord's table. And I, I, for a long time, I did not like the Lord's table because I didn't understand it, and it scared me. And I didn't want to eat and drink unworthily and eat and drink to myself damnation. Now let's look at this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. Now in this, I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now think of what Paul's saying to these people. He's saying when you come together to take the Lord's table, it's not for your benefit. It's your meeting for the worse, not the better. Now let's see why he says this. Because that's what if the what if Paul said, You all are wasting your time taking the Lord's table. You're you're desecrating it. You're you're destroying the true meaning, which is what he's saying to these people. And this was a true church. Don't forget that. Could a true church get so messed up? Of course it could. Of course it could. Never think in terms of that. Uh, anything can happen if the Lord doesn't permit it. But let's go on reading. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions, schisms among you. And I partly believe it, for there must be also, notice this word, there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Now, do you hear that? There must be heresies among you. People believing false gospels, false things. That is necessary. It must happen so that they which are truly approved may be made manifest among you. Verse 20, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You say you're meeting to eat the Lord's Supper, but that's not what you're doing. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Now, think about what he's saying. You're coming together for the Lord's table for a feast. You're hungry. You want to satisfy your hunger. And the drunken is actually intoxicated. Somebody takes the wine and actually becomes intoxicated through it. That's what he's talking about. When you get together for the Lord's supper, you're not getting together in remembrance of him. You're getting together to have a feast. To have a good time, to get your bellies filled, to drink up. That is why you're drinking, that's why you're eating, and that is not the Lord's table. Verse 22, what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? Some had a bunch of food, and they bring their food. Is it bring your own food? Kind of like a potluck. Well, I don't guess it's a potluck. I guess everybody just brought their own food. Some had a feast. Some didn't have much money and didn't even have enough to eat. And so you had this one group feasting. You had another group that didn't have hardly anything. What, have you not houses to eat and drink in or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now before I go on reading, there's a verse of scripture that the Catholic Church has taught transubstantiation. When you eat that bread, it turns into the body of Christ. When you drink that wine, it turns into the blood of Christ. Transubstantiation. And some people watered it down, know it's consubstantiation. That only works with believers. When believers eat it, it turns into the body of Christ. And when they drink it, it turns into the body of Christ. But if an unbeliever drinks or eats it, it doesn't do him any good. It can only be believers. So here, once again, you can take these verses of Scripture and all the things you could teach from them and preach from them. This doctrine of, 
of of the real presence of the body and blood of Christ comes from these verses. And if you take them on face value, I guess you could look at it that way if you want to. Like I said, the Lord has truth stated in such a way, if you want to hang yourself, you can do it from the Bible. You can prove anything you want from the Bible. And men have been doing it for centuries. Verse 25, after the same manner also. He did the same thing. He took the cup and weeds up, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of what I have done for you. In remembrance of my person. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Everybody that eats this bread and drinks this cup is preaching a sermon. We're showing the Lord's death. Oh, what does the Lord's death mean to you? What's the Lord's death mean to you? It's Christ that died. That's the only hope of my salvation. That's all I have. It's Christ that died. You're showing forth. The, that's what you're saying. It's Christ that died. That's my hope of salvation, that my sin became his sin, and he put it away. He died, was raised again. Everybody that observes the Lord's table is preaching this sermon. You're showing forth the Lord's death until he come. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, does that mean you have to have sufficient worthiness before you can eat the bread and drink the cup? Do you know that churches actually use this to discipline people? You've got a board of elders, big shots in the church, and if somebody's life isn't measuring up, no, you can't eat. You, you need to get your life straightened out before you can eat and drink. And they use that as a means of discipline. Wow. You want to take that responsibility yourself? Nobody has the right to do something like that. Uh, the Lord said, examine yourselves and so let him eat, not let him not eat, let him eat. Uh, do you feel, well, I've, I've, my life is such now that I think I'm worthy to eat the Lord's table. I've, I've got a handle on sin now and I've, I'm, I've, I've stopped this sin and I've started doing this thing and I think I'm ready to eat the Lord's table right now. That's called eating it unworthily. That's what that is. That's having no discernment, no understanding of what we're doing when we're observing the Lord's table. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, look what it says next, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, some sins are worse than others. This is one of them. To eat the Lord's table unworthily is equivalent with being the murderer of the Lord Jesus Christ and driving the nails in his hands and in his feet. Now that is scary, isn't it? Okay, let's go on reading. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now what is it we're examining? Is Christ Jesus the Lord really the only hope I have? Am I looking only to what he did as everything in my personal salvation? I want to examine myself. Am I looking to my works? Am I looking to any evidences in me that makes me think I'm worthy? Better not eat. That's a failure to discern the Lord's body. Now, I discern the Lord's body and I discern the Lord's blood when I understand who he is, what he did, why he did it, and what he accomplished by that. And I'm looking only 
to him. That's what we do when we discern the Lord's body. But let a man examine himself. I love that passage in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. But I'm looking forward to eating the Lord's table because I know this is all I have. I believe that. I believe that. And I'm going to do this by His grace in remembrance of Him. It's a celebration. It's, it's not, oh, but, you know, I, am, I, am I worthy? Well, of course I'm not worthy. But He is. And this is all my hope. This is all my salvation. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh <clears throat> damnation to himself. Condemnation. Not discerning the Lord's body. <coughs> For this cause, because men eat and drink unworthily, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many have died. Now, I don't know what all to say about that. Uh, somebody gets sick. Well, did they take the Lord's table unworthily? Don't think things like that. Somebody gets some illness, wonder what they did. Don't think like that. Sickness is of the Lord. And if you're sick, it's of the Lord, and it's for your good. And his glory. So don't look at someone. You don't, well, I wonder what they did. I think of that passage of scripture uh, where the Lord and his disciples went by the man who was born blind, and this disciple said, Who sinned? Uh, this man or his parents? He's born blind. And the Lord said, Neither. Don't look at things like that. But still, this passage of scripture does say, I don't know what all to say about it. I wish I did. But it does say that those who eat and drink unworthily, many are weak, many are sickly, many sleep, many die because of this. So this shows how serious this is. I've heard people say, well, it doesn't mean that. Well, what does it mean then? What does it mean? I don't know what to say about it. I can't give a detailed explanation of what all is meant by this, but it sure doesn't sound good, does it? I want to eat worthily. And drink worthily, looking to Christ only. For, I love this verse, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now here's the one judgment that's good. Judge yourself. Judge yourself. You judge anybody else, it's wrong. It's wrong. All the time. Paul said, let us not judge one another any more. I love that scripture where the Lord says, Judge not that you be judged. For with the same judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it'll be meted out to you again. Now that sure enough doesn't mean that if you judge somebody, God's going to judge you and send you to hell. Because if that's the case, ain't none of us going to be saved, are we? Whenever you judge someone, they're going to be looking for faults in you. They're going to judge you. They're going to scrutinize you. They're going to make you miserable. And that's what the Lord means. And then Paul said, judge not. Let's not judge one another anymore. But here's one judgment that's good. You don't have enough sins. I don't have enough sins to make a proper judgment about anything with regard to anybody. Why do you do it then? Because I'm a sinner. It's wrong. We shouldn't do it. But here's a judgment we should make. If we would judge ourselves, if we would condemn ourselves, if we would criticize ourselves, if we would see our own sinfulness, we should not be judged. You see, that person who judges themselves comes to Christ with a rope around his neck. God, be merciful to me, the sinner, guilty as charged. And somebody that comes like that will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, I don't want to be chastened, but I want to be chastened, don't you? I don't want to be chastened, but I want to be chastened. Because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son that he receives. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together 
unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Now, what is the one requirement to the Lord's table that we're getting ready to do? Same requirement as baptism. Believing the gospel. Faith. Faith is the one requirement. So I want to spend the last couple of minutes asking this question. What is faith? It's critical that I know. And I've got several go-to scriptures I always love to go to to illustrate and define what faith is according to the scripture. But here's one that I don't use as much, and it's the one I read at the first of this message. If you want to understand what faith is, whether you should be baptized, whether you should take the Lord's table, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 13, these all, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, the people had mentioned up to this point, these all died. Now, don't forget, that's your end. These all died. Every one of them. These all died. If the Lord doesn't return first, me and you are going to die. I always think it's kind of funny. If you went to the doctor tomorrow and the doctor said, you're going to die, you'd be so upset. Well, the Bible tells us that. You're going to die. These all died. But how did they die? These all died in faith. Now, that's how I want to die. In faith. You know what that means? That means they persevered in the faith. They continued in the faith. Grounded and settled. And they were not moved from the hope of the gospel. And it means they never graduated past faith. They never got above it. The just shall live by faith. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. These all died in faith. They persevered in the faith, and they never got past faith. Now, what's it say about them next? These all died in faith, not having received the promises. God gave them some promises. The Messiah is coming through you. He promised all the land of Canaan, all these promises that he gave them, and they never experienced them. They never really entered in. They never received the promises. Now, salvation is by the promise of God. Amen. What's that mean? It means this. The reason you're forgiven is not because of anything you've done or even asked it for, or cried for. You're forgiven because God promised you'd be forgiven for Christ's sake. Your salvation began with the complete forgiveness of sins. And it doesn't have anything to do with anything you've done. It's all because of the promise of God. Justification. You know what justification means? You don't have any sin. Have you experienced that? No. You still feel it's sinful, more sinful now than you've ever felt. No, you haven't experienced that. They haven't received the promises. It's promised that you're just like Christ, perfectly conformed to His image. Have you entered into the experience of that? No. They didn't receive the promises. They died in faith, having never in their life experienced these promises. But what's it say about them? But having seen them afar off. Having seen them afar off. Now, faith sees by the ear. Ear is the sight faith. And you've heard, perhaps afar off, 
but you've heard how you can be sinless before God. You've heard how you can be justified before God. You've heard you are justified before God. Now, you haven't received it in your experience. You still sin, but you've seen it far off. You've seen it in the Word. You've seen it in the preaching of the gospel. You've seen it afar off. I, I have. I've seen it afar off. No, I haven't experienced it. But I've seen it afar off. And what to say next? Having seen them afar off, these promises of God, and were persuaded of them. They were persuaded of them. Now, this is interesting. This is spoken of in the passive. It's literally, they've been persuaded. If you're persuaded, it's because you've been persuaded. And you know who it was who persuaded you? God himself. Are you persuaded that the Bible is the word of God? You know why? God persuaded you. Are you persuaded that Christ is all in salvation? You know why? It's because God persuaded you. So they saw these promises afar off, the promises of complete salvation. They were persuaded of them. I believe this. I believe this. God has persuaded me. I believe that everybody that Christ died for must be saved. I believe that his precious blood cleanses us from all sin. Now, do I receive it in a sense of experience? No, I still sin. But I believe I'm cleansed from all sin because I've been persuaded. And I love this next word. They embraced them. They embraced them. They welcomed them. This is good news. I love this. They embraced them. Hugged them tightly. Rejoiced in what they were hearing. This is the best thing I've ever heard. I'm embracing this. It's glorious to me. Now there, in this thing of embracing, where it always comes as good news, here's the reason. My need. You know, I've seen people grow weary of the gospel. And become dull in hearing. The heavenly manna has become light bread. And the gospel no longer comes as good news. It's become old and dry. And it's just doctrine. Dry doctrine. Well, when someone has reached that point, let me tell you why. They've lost their sense of need. They're not hearing as sinners something above that. If I hear as a sinner, I will embrace the gospel as good news. You know, I need, we, you know, we, I need God to elect me. I need Christ to die for me. I need God the Holy Spirit to give me life. I need to be preserved right now. That's what I need. It's not old. It's not something, well, I've already learned that. I need it right now, and I embrace. And then the last thing in this thing of these people who died in faith, look at it. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. They didn't enter into the fullness of the experience of it, but having seen them afar off, they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed. Now, this is part of faith. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, with faith, there's always confession. And confession, there's something public about it. It can take many forms, but there's something public about it. I mean, you're publicly identifying with this message. Right now, you're confessing this message. If you believe this message, you're coming here to take the Lord's table. You're making a public confession right now. This is all of my salvation. I've already said baptism 
is your confession. You confess with your mouth. Um, you confess with your life. But there's something public about it. Uh, when you meet some of those people who say, well, my, you know, my, I believe people ought to just be private about their religion. Well, you can believe that, but you'll be, not be saved. Um, confession is unto salvation. This is part of true saving faith. What you, I have believed, here's what David, he called the spirit of faith. Paul called this quote from David, the spirit of faith. I believed, therefore have I spoken. Now, does this mean you're able to articulate all the, not necessarily, but you stand for it. You stand for it. You might not be able to articulate everything, but you're casting in your lot with those who preach the gospel you believe, publicly confessing. That's what faith is. Who should take the Lord's table? Everyone, without exception, in faith, who hadn't received the promises in the sense of, I've not experienced sinlessness or justification, but I believe. I've seen them afar off in the gospel. And I've been persuaded. That's the reason I believe. I've been persuaded. And I embrace. And I confess. What is required for the Lord's table? The same thing that's required for baptism. Faith. Faith in Christ. Now, let me remind you. Faith is not believing that you're saved. Faith is not believing that Jesus Christ died for you. Faith is not believing you're one of the elect. Faith is not believing that you've been born again. Faith is believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Faith doesn't have anything to do with what you believe about yourself. Now, it's a great thing if the Lord gives us grace till we know we're elect, children of God, and all that kind of stuff, but that is not what faith is. Faith is what you believe concerning Christ. Do you believe that he's the Son of God? Do you believe he's the Christ? Do you believe that if he represents you before the Father, you must be saved? you believe that? Are you relying only on him and you don't have anything else? That's called faith in Christ. And when we observe the Lord's table, we're showing forth his death together until he comes. You know, you can't take the Lord's table by yourself. You can't say, I'm going to take the Lord's table. I'm going to pour me some wine and I'm going to give me some leavened bread, unleavened bread and I'm going to eat the bread and I'm going to drink the wine and I'm taking the Lord's table. You can't do that. This is something done with the brethren, with the church, gathering together for this purpose, doing this in remembrance of him. Now let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that we might be enabled to eat this bread and drink of this cup in remembrance of Thee, our blessed Savior. And Lord, we're showing forth the death of Thy Son is everything in our salvation. And Lord, let us do this with joy and confidence knowing that however pleased you are with him, you're pleased with everybody in him. And our great desire is that we might be found in him. In his name we pray.